this is the Sunday within the octave of the Ascension. And next Sunday will be Pentecost, the birth of the church. I use my wonderful little booklet here that Bob Hood discovered somewhere for us, which has sermons given about 70 years ago on, for different Sundays. And uh, the sermon that was chosen for this Sunday is taken from the Reverend Alexander MacDonald, a bishop. He comes from the same place that Brother Hugh came from, and Brother Hugh has MacDonalds in his family, so I, I'd like to think that he is a kind of a cousin of Brother Hugh. And I've read one of his sermons once before. It's really excellent. Uh, everything he says is terrific. Real strong faith. He made his sermon this Sunday because it, this usually falls in May, as you would expect on Our Lady. I will just read at least a little bit of it before I start doing anything else because I don't want to miss this opportunity. It's the special office and prerogative of the Virgin Mother to lay our wants before her divine Son, that he may relieve them. The words she said at the marriage feast, she is saying evermore. Notice she didn't say it to our Lord to do anything, she just said to him, they have no wine. And that's all she needs to say for any of the needs that we have. Just tell him, that, remind him that they do have a need. That's all she needs to say, just hint. But they have taken on a new and deeper meaning and are of universal application. Wine is the symbol of joy. Wine, as we are told in Holy Writ, maketh the heart glad. We as a race have forfeited the joy of living, which God meant from the first should be our birthright. Through the disobedience of one man, sin entered the world, and through sin, sorrow. That's why we call this earth, or life in it, the veil of tears. For sorrow is the child of sin, as joy is the daughter of innocence. That earthly paradise, which but for sin would have been our goodly inheritance, is closed forever against us. He says, is closed forever, that means per se. Left, if it were left to us, that's it. We just threw it away and we don't belong to that order except for the fact of Christ, our Lady, and the redemption. God has set at its gate his angel with a sword of fire to bar our race from ever entering there again. Since then, earth has known much sorrow and very little joy. True joy is not now native here, as it once was. It has to come from without, to be borrowed. A poet of our day sings, I don't know if, I've, if I have heard this before, but it's so natural that you almost think you always knew it. Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and you weep alone. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth, but has sorrow enough of its own. <laughs> Who wrote that? Does anybody know? There is no joy in the world today. If you, have, if you don't believe me, just go down to Boston Common and watch the faces. Or if you want something even worse, go down to Harvard Square, where we used to be for many, many years, and watch the faces that passed by. You find people giggling, you find people grinning, you find people riotous, screaming, shouting, but you don't see any joy. <clears throat> and the only thing that brings joy to the world is the faith, our holy faith. That is why we call it the gospel, which means good news. That's the only good news, and the only good news in eternity, in heaven, if they issue, if there are headlines in heaven, is when somebody on this earth decides to go the whole way for the faith. When somebody decides to try to be a saint, that makes good news in heaven. Nothing else, everything else 
just sad. Sadness, sadness, sadness. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And who are they? What is that prophecy about? That's from the Psalms. What, what, whose feet bring the good news? Those who come to tell people about salvation and how to obtain it. And the devil, who is the, who doesn't have any joy at all, but has glee, we call it, we have a word for his kind, his substitute. The kingdom of hell has substitutes for all the things of the kingdom of heaven. And his substitute for joy is glee. And he has a glee at our sadness. The more awkward we become, and the more sad, and the more confused, the more he has a glee to go along with it. Uh, he has made sure that instead of the clear message which gives people joy, the certitude, the confidence, he just made sure that some phony message that promises nothing, commits itself to nothing definite, asks people for no challenging commitment. He made it the substitute for what the apostles gave the world in the beginning and what throughout the centuries the church continued to be apostolic in that same sense. And it all boils down to the one thing. There was a time when, when a person said, How, what can I do to be saved? Once you convince him that there is such a thing as salvation, you told him something very definite. You say you accept the faith as taught by the one true church. You seek its sacraments, which are the only means God established for communicating the fruits of his redemption. And then you live according to this commitment, obeying the laws God established for his church. So you accept the faith, you seek the sacraments beginning with baptism, and you obey the authority of the church supremely in the Holy Father. That's the formula. It's clear. It's definite. A child can understand it. But the way they are talking today, you just don't know what they are telling anybody. They are just assuming either the whole thing is just a myth or that it's not very indefinite, they are not given any clear and definite challenge. And as a result, they are not given the gospel message that gives joy back into the world. Now, next week we will be celebrating the birthday of the church. The new order of the gospel, the New Testament, that's the true new order. That's not the Masonic Novus Ordo. That's the that's the real New Testament. The new covenant of God began with Pentecost. With 11 of the apostles and Our Lady in their midst filled the number 12 by electing St. Matthias. And from that instant, a new fire got into what they already had been taught by our Lord. The Holy Ghost did not come to found a new church that's what's wrong with this Pentecostalism on the loose today. It's so dissociated in principle from the incarnational and institutional church. It's a kind of irresponsible pouring out as if the Holy Ghost was a new divinity. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, one God. What Jesus Christ taught, the Holy Ghost did not teach another truth. He just gave them the deep realization of what they had already learned and send them out like flaming fire to spread that throughout the world. Now, this is the gospel for today. Sunday after the ascension. Exaudi Domine Voce Meam. Hear, O Lord, my voice as I cry to you. Alleluia. My heart has spoken to you. I have sought you. Your presence, O Lord, I will seek. Hide not your face from me. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom sh should I fear? Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The reading. Beloved, be prudent and watchful in prayers. This is taken from the epistle of St. Peter. <coughs> 
the first epistle of St. Peter. Beloved, be prudent and watchful in prayers, but above all things have a constant mutual charity among yourselves, for charity covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without murmuring, according to the gift that each has received, administer it to one another as good rewards of the manifold grace of God. One of the beautiful things our present Holy Father said very early in his pontificate, he said that in the divine economy, God made it so that those who help others to save their souls by that very act of hospitality and generosity guarantee the salvation of their own. What a consoling thought and what a wise statement to know. So St. Peter is asking them to share the gifts that God gave them. The church will always be living up to the spirit of the apostles when it remains apostolic. The true charity is to give the faith to the world. There is no salvation without the faith. The very first act we take, anybody takes, from a child to an adult, in the direction of that supernatural happiness we call beatitude, is an act of faith. And until we let people know that, anything else we are pretending to do for them <clears throat> is distracting them from the true happiness that God intended for them. There is no true charity. I don't know any statement that our dear Father repeated to us more often. There is no true charity until you have the faith. A person who does not have the faith he doesn't even know how to love himself. When God told us how to love other people, he said, love your neighbor as thyself. He presumed that we already know how to love ourselves. The only true love for anybody's self is the eternal salvation. It follows logically if there is such a thing. Just imagine if it is true, and it is absolutely true, huh. It follows right away from that major fact of all history that we should never take out of our attention, the event of the God coming and achieving our redemption. That's a beautiful picture here, and it's meant just to keep that in our mind. That's why the crucifix is in every rosary, and every Catholic should have a rosary on himself. Never be caught without a rosary. Wherever we are, we should never cease to think of that tremendous event. There is no charity. If there is an eternity, just imagine, what could you do to a man? You say you could help him to get over his toothache or bandage his wounds or no matter. What could you do to a man if, he, if he's going to exist forever? Then see to it that he exists forever, not in hell but in heaven. Now that is the simple wisdom of all the catechisms of the centuries. Now, they don't talk about the catechisms, they talk about catechesis. So instead of an objective body of truth to be communicated, it's a kind of a process. We get all giddy, psychedelic, and we just put us in a, like, almost like having taken uh, uh, some kind of uh, drug, you know, just to make us feel good. And you don't, you don't know what you are believing or what you are holding or what you are committed to. So what were we made for? To know and to love and to serve God in this life and be happy with him forever. This sentence has more wisdom than all the books of the philosophers and all the theories of the scientists. And why are we not teaching that anymore? And why has anything taken the place of it? And why is it not the center of everything we teach and think? This is the sense in which we should never cease to be children, because that's the kind of wisdom you can teach to a child and even when an adult hoards it, he still has to go back to be a child, to see it in its clarity, simplicity, innocence. That's the only reason we exist. And until we know that God has established definite rules for how to achieve our eternal happiness, and we are bound to observe them, until we know that, there is nothing we are doing that's going to amount to anything. Every time you get the papers, bad news. You get news from China, bad news. From Japan, bad news. From South America, bad news. From Africa, bad news. It's going to continue to be so. And the one great wisdom that Father Feeney was the 
one piece of this century that was given the grace to see was to discover where that bad news is all proceeding from. What is the ultimate cause for it all? And it's a simple, fundamental dogma of the faith. But it's, the, it's not just the dogma of the faith, it's the keystone dogma. It's the dogma which once you remove, the whole building collapses, comes down. <clears throat> I remember seeing once the four Mark brothers, who's the one who was always silent, didn't say a word. He was, he was standing up there, and a tremendous building over him. And then his brother comes by, he said to him, what are you doing, holding the building? He nodded. So he, he yanked him away, and the whole building came. <laughs> so this, was the, this wasn't just a dogma, it was the dogma that held the whole building together. If there is salvation outside the church, why do I have to get up early on Sunday to go to Mass? Let's begin with one simple, silly thing like that. Why, why anything? Why anybody should be committed to anything? They say they have no vocations. Why should there be any vocations? When they are telling them that the Muslims can be saved by their sheikhs and the Jews by their rabbis and the Protestants by their ministers, why should anybody go and become a priest? I mean... Why not, why not let people just get to heaven the way they are going? <clears throat> so uh, there is nothing that has happened in the whole history of the church, and I challenge anybody to deny it or to read history and not to see that. And so once they decided, and there is no question now, absolutely no question, that very deliberately they decided to get rid of this doctrine. There is no question. When we accused them of having done it, we were a little bit guessing in the early 40s. It was in about 1945 that we came out publicly. Now, if we had gone on talking in our little room, it was bigger than this room, but not much bigger. Nobody would have bothered with us. We'd be still serving tea to Harvard students and Radcliffe girls and at five o'clock and answering their skeptical questions, trying to ex convince them that they exist, not that God exists. We were way beyond the, that stage. <laughs> you couldn't convince them that they existed. How do I know? Well, maybe it's all a dream. Maybe I just think I exist. And all that. We'd be still talking that way, and nobody would have ever bothered us. But because we issued the house tops, and it was going to not too, too many people. The house tops today goes to about 50 times as many people as the house tops in the 40s. We have about at least maybe 100 times as many people read us now than at that time. But it did go to seminaries, it did go to colleges, it did go to the writers and to the people who published papers and so on. And just because we say to them, there is a conspiracy to suppress a fundamental dogma of the faith, that's what started the whole rumpus. That's why the big explosion, Father used to call, we hit the jackpot. Well, that's what we hit the jackpot. <laughs> Because we, he did definitely, what he said to us, I remember his word exactly. He called Sister Catherine and myself. We were, the, he, we were the first people. I mean, we were his closest associates, and we were the teachers with him. And before he said it to anybody else, this is exactly his exact words. I put my finger on what is causing all the trouble in the church. They are trying to get rid of the dogma. Outside the church, there is no salvation. There is no question to my mind. I have had now over f about 40 years thinking about it and studying about it. There is no question about it to my mind that he had it. That is it. That was the sentence of the century. He put his finger on what's causing all the trouble. Why the mission work has stopped. Why our school system in the whole United States is completely being dissolved every time you open the paper. Why one convent after another, one monastery after another, are being mm -hmm. sold out. They become every conceivable thing. A, a book could be written on the thousands and thousands of acres that were once Catholic institutions and are now going into transcendental meditation <laughs> or Buddhist monasteries or you don't know what. That's why. It's all going back to that one thing, and it's the one thing that we are still defending right here. Now, if we hadn't had the, the defection that divided us, the whole world would be, we would be on top of the world today. But 
that the faction slowed us down a little bit, but don't worry. Just give us five more years and you'll see. We will be just exactly where we should have been today, but we will be then clear with no cowards, no traitors, no people dealing with the enemy while they're grinning at you and pretending that they are fighting the same crusade with you. <coughs> Thank God we got rid of the hypocrites and the liars and the traitors. <laughs> and the sooner we got rid of them, even in the temporal order, in the national matters, in the patriotic matters, the faster we will go back to recovery. So something has happened to us, which is a figure of what has happened to the whole church. We, see, we saw it right here under our eyes. Now let me read you the gospel for today. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, when the Advocate has come, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness concerning me, and you also will bear witness, because from the beginning you are with me. These things I have spoken to you, that you may not be scandalized. They will expel you from the synagogues. Yes, the hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering worship to God. <coughs> And these things they will do because they have not known the Father nor me. Now, is he excusing them for their ignorance? A little bit. The fact that they are doing it out of ignorance just doesn't make it as terrible, as horrid, as if they did it with full knowledge. But their very ignorance is sinful and culpable, and they can go to hell for it. Now, that's the spirit of this whole thing. And if I read you that whole sermon today, the two sermons I had prepared, if I had time, I would read some of them, Father Goffinet and Father MacDonald, Bishop MacDonald, you will find that they both say the same thing. That ignorance, that supposed sincerity, sincerity, <laughs> they are doing it sincerely. They think you are wrong, so on. That is also wicked and sinful and certainly is not the way to go to heaven. The Holy Ghost can only work on truth, never on error. Sincere error, even sincere error. The Holy Ghost can't work on sincere error. But if there is true sincerity, he will always work on it to bring it back to the full truth. And these things they will do because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have spoken to you, that when the time for them has come, you may remember that I told you. The sentence you have on board is taken from the Mass for today. And you see now, gradually, you will find that the Latin language becomes more and more familiar to us. As children of the Church, we love this holy language. We love a language that all the great saints loved. This is Catholic lo loyalty. These are Catholic hearts. Non vos relinquam. I think I wrote it on the board, non relinquam vos, makes very little difference. I memorized it, <coughs> non relinquam vos orphanos. I shall not leave you orphans. Now, that is a sentence that you can spend the whole week meditating. That's a wonderful thing for the week between the Ascension and Pentecost. Our Lord used these words, I shall not leave you orphans. Now, see in how many ways he has not left us orphans. He has given us a mother in heaven, so he's not left us orphans. He has come back to be with us. He is with us in the Eucharist, in the Holy Mass. He is with us as he becomes us in the mystical body, by that unity that can only come in its fullness from the Eucharist, from communion. That's how much he has not left us. He said, I go, but I also will come and your heart shall rejoice. And so this is a Sunday talking about joy. I began with the idea of joy, and here is my quotation, which is taken from the center of the Mass, and it's also talking about joy. And it's that joy that can only follow upon the faith. True and loyal faith, there is a joy that goes even in sorrow, even in difficulties, even in troubles. A Catholic is never gloomy, never loses his joy. They say that uh, the uh, Pope Benedict uh, the Fourteenth, the Pope who uh, wrote in the most definite form 
the laws for canonization. And he, he both studied the acts of the popes before him, as well as establishing the principles for those who would follow. Four things are required before a person can be canonized a saint in the church. The first, they have to have the true faith, objectively the true faith. Second, they have to have perseverance to the very end. It has to be shown that right to the very end of their life, they never quit it. He that perseveres to the end, he shall be saved. Third, to be saints, they have to practice the virtues that all Catholics are bound to practice, but to a heroic degree. So the saints, when they are canonized, are declared as our heroes. The fourth, and in some sense, the most crucial and most important, they should be men and women of great joy. They should be radiant, that's the word he used, radiant with joy. So if you have a very sad face, well, don't expect to be canonized. That will be the first thing that the, the advocatus diaboli will use against you. <laughs> there are patrons in heaven for almost any kind of human strength or weakness or deficiency or expertise. But there is no patron for those who are gloomy. <laughs> so let us all be joyful. Now, the heroes for this month, I, uh, sometimes I start the month by telling you who are the great saints of the month, but this time there was so much going on and so much on my mind, I no never get down to it. Now, we try to know together, I know some of you know even more than that. <clears throat> oh, by the way, our first diploma for the St. Augustine Institute of Catholic Studies will be uh, granted on the Feast of the Assumption. And I think there will be only one this time, and it is Mr. McNamara. <laughs> I, I also want to let you know that our program of studies, our circles, are a tremendous success. And we constantly are getting great encouragement from them. And all that's required is for people to persevere. It's not something we... I mean, supposing, supposing our Lord said, I want you to be like the Christians of the first 300 years. Every week, somebody being martyred or everybody living as if expecting martyr in the second hour and so on. I think, I hope, we would be generous enough, at least in theory, to say we are all ready to do it. But our Lord is not asking that of us. He's asking for much less than that. But he's saying you have to know the faith, and then once you know it, then you can communicate it. Now, doesn't that stand to reason? Can anybody get to know the faith in its fullness and richness without giving some time to it? Is there any other way of doing it? Can you get to know the saints if you don't even try to know who they are, when they lived, read their books, read about them? Can you get the story of the church to know what has happened to the church, why it has collapsed, why so many wonderful things that were happening suddenly just simply ceased to have any reality or any effect? Is there any other way of doing it except to dedicate some definite time and discipline ourselves and say this is the time dedicated for this work and nothing else will take stand in its way? Or if we want to be apostles and reach the faith and give it to other people, could anybody give what he hasn't got? Have you ever heard of anybody able to contribute what he hasn't got? If you want to make the house warm in summer, you don't bring a chunk of ice into the house. <laughs> you bring something warm, hot. So unless we have it in us, how are we going to communicate it? It's a very simple formula. And God gave us a, a beautiful and we don't, you don't have to be a millionaire. You don't have to raise millions to get started. People have been meeting in a home. Don't have any funds at all. They start building up a little library. Very poor. But they have to have character. If they decided to set up Wednesday night for that, that Wednesday night should become sacrosanct. Now, is that too much to ask? And then meet regularly. 
week by week, and how God will bless it. Just that faithfulness, that perseverance. Richard Ziblicki was here just a couple of weeks ago. He told us that the Holy Family Circle in Milwaukee, which, by the way, is also becoming a tremendous center of Catholic action. They are running a school now for the children that need a school for themselves. And they are doing many, many other things. They have met, I forget now the exact number, but certainly over 200 times without any interruption. Not one single week missed, and with very few absences. Now that's a wonderful record. One circle I was worried about, and we just heard from them this week. And he said, we have been meeting most faithfully. We have been very busy, we didn't send our reports and so on, but still we have been meeting most faithfully. And by the way, they sent a very substantial contribution. That's one other circle and so on. So the, the circles are doing very, very well. But this is an intention I want you to keep in your prayers. We want to convert America. America can be converted, but it's not going to be converted spontaneously, <coughs> automatically, without anybody putting any kind of effort or aiming at the thing. Nothing happens, but if St. Patrick had determined to go and convert the Irish people, they probably would be still pagan today. <laughs> so somebody has to make, a, make an effort. So we want to convert America, and that's the way it's going to be done. Now, we said uh, among us, we all learn at least half the saints of every month. I know that Mac knows much more than one half, but for the rest of us, it's enough to say that we all have to know at least one half the saints of every month. In the month of May, dedicated to Our Lady. Very good. Some people might not know what April is dedicated to, or February, but I don't know anybody in the whole country, even if they are not Catholic. What is May? Our Lady's Month. Everybody was noticing last week, they talk about these invincibly ignorant natives, and you say, where are they in Africa? He, the Pope, was in Africa, in a nation, and by any standard or qualification, they are more Catholic than we are. 45% <laughs> Catholic, I think. And the enthusiasm, they even killed each other before to just to come and take a look at the Pope. I mean, I am not recommending stepping on people to death, but I don't think you could do it for... I don't, I don't think they would have killed eight people to look at Carter. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the month of May, usually the Feast of the Ascension of Ant Pentecost both occur. Ascension and Pentecost. We don't give them a definite date because they, this year, Ascension was the 15th and Pentecost the 25th. But next year, it may not be that. But usually they fall in, in May. The finding of the true cross is the 3rd of May. That's a great feast in the East where I was a child. They always make a fire on every hill because they say that when St. Helena discovered the cross in Jerusalem, the message was received in Constantinople almost as if they had the wireless because as soon as the Christians discovered that they found the true cross, they started a fire on the first hill in Jerusalem, and every Christian community that saw that fire started another fire, and in no time, the Christians of Constantinople, at about two, three thousand miles away, discovered the fact in a matter of uh, minutes. So that they keep that tradition going, the Christians of the Near East. Uh, that, that's quite a story there. I mean, the very survival of Christianity in the Arab world is, is something. It's just something. What, what a miracle it was that there are millions of people in the midst of this ocean of Islam, a very militant, anti-Catholic fighting religion that's spread by the sword, by the way. Any kind of fight that Christianity has ever put against Islam is in self-defense. If Charles Martel hadn't stopped them, they would have taken the whole world. At some point, somebody has to stand up and fight. I mean, you can't keep... But anyway, so the Christians in the Near East are still keeping that tradition. On the Feast of the Finding of the True Cross, they, every single hill has a big fire on top of it. Is that wonderful? Now, these are the tributes to the faith, but just large facts.
not the kind of thing that you say, well, who knows about it? Or everybody knows what that fire means. We, when we read the Matirazi every night, there are about 50 names for every day. I mean, but we try to remember at least to associate every day with at least one thing. Or, yeah, there, are, there are many saints on the third of May. The third of May. Our Lady of Fatima is the 13th of May, the third, the Holy Cross, the 13th, Our Lady of Fatima. But it's uh, the 13th of May, uh, so many things are attached to it. It's also the Feast of Our Lady, Queen of Martyrs. And it's also the Feast of Our Lady of the Eucharist. So Our Lady appeared at Fatima on a day that w was already hers by a double formality as the Queen of Martyrs and the Queen of the Eucharist. That's something to think about. It's also the feast of the Doctor of the Church. Who is that? Uh, so all the, all the Roberts here, happy feast day. <coughs> Just celebrated the feast of St. Robert. All right. Our Lady Help of Christians is May the 24th. Our Lady the Queen, the Queenship of Mary, the last day of the month, the 31st. And then, the dear spouse of Our Lady, St. Joseph, has the first day of the month under his title as Joseph the Worker. So we have seven days just connected with Our Lady and the Holy Family. Isn't that amazing? With, with Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. That seven days in, in, in May. In May, there are, I mentioned one doctor of the church, but there are four doctors of, of the church in May. Who are the four doctors of the church in May? Four or five, let me see. Four. four, just four. Saint Athanasius and Saint Gregory Nazianzen, the second and the ninth. Now, if you want a good memorial technica, the, the ninth is the octave of the second, isn't it? How do you find the octave? You add seven. Well, now, Saint Athanasius was the doctor of the church as the, at the first ecumenical council. What is it? Nicaea. The first. And St. Gregory Nazianzen was the great champion of the faith at the second ecumenical council, Constantinople the first. Now, isn't that a little fact of history that Father would say to you if we were talking here? He would say, I challenge you to forget it. You try to forget it. <laughs> Just as long as you live now, try to forget that the, the first name you think of when you think of Dr. Luce is St. Athanasius. And you associate him with the very first ecumenical council, Nicaea the first. Nicaea the first. What was defended at the council of Nicaea the first? The divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, every heretic throughout history has been somewhat of an alien. That's why they call it, some, in some sense, the heresy of all heresies. They start. To, they, they never. Very few. Very few people who call themselves Christians at all deny that somehow our Lord is divine or in some sense the Son of God. You say, is Jesus, you ask most, most Protestants in this country, do you believe that Jesus is God? Well, I wouldn't put it that way. I'd say he's the Son of God. Well, you mean uh, we are all children of God, aren't we? Well, of course. You know, so he's just another child of God like we are. Well. Yeah, well, but he, oh, he was much more excellent in moral character and so on. So, so it's just a matter of degree. So we are all, you know, somehow. To believe that Jesus is God is to believe that he is eternal. That before the sun was created, before anything existed, he existed with the same mind as the Father and the Holy Ghost, an eternal person. He's absolutely singular and unique. We are brought in the orbit of the life of God and become children by grace, only, the only way is by being attracted to his reality. It's by becoming the mystical body, the continuation of what he is, that will become in an entirely different order and in an entirely different sense also children of God. That was the dogma defended at the first ecumenical council, Nicaea the first. Who was the champion of the faith at that council? Saint Athanasius. His feast is May 2nd. 
Now, isn't that history? Isn't that theology? Isn't that devotion? Isn't that wonderful? And you see how readily it's beginning to grow. When we started learning the names of the doctors, Father said to us, you continue to repeat those names. When, we, when he started teaching us the doctors of the church, they were only 28. Then they became 29 when St. Anthony of Padua was declared a doctor. Then they became 30 when St. Lawrence of Brindisi was declared a doctor. And then recently, now we say there are 32, after St. Catherine of Siena and St. Teresa of Avila were declared doctors of the church. Now that's quite interesting. That's the first time that a woman was declared. It, ha it has to mean to us now that they are recognize recognizing not merely the way the church teaches officially from the pulpit, which a woman cannot do, but the way the faith has been transmitted on the knees of mothers and in the classrooms of nuns by the millions, the millions and millions of people. They learn the faith and learn it brilliantly and clearly from women. So that's a kind of a new recognition. But now we can say there are 32 doctors of the church. And Father said to us, you first memorize their names, and then you learn their feasts, and before you know it, you are theologians, because you start to learn one thing from one, another thing from another. And you know the church, you know the, the theology of the church, <coughs> you know the fight to preserve the deposit of faith, and what it cost the centuries for that faith to still survive and reach us today exactly as it was taught by the Twelve Apostles. Isn't that a miracle? Any man of goodwill today could learn the Catholic faith exactly as if he got it from St. Peter. Isn't that a miracle that it has been preserved? And if you want to know the battles that tried to cloud it, disturb it, confuse it, weaken it, but the church fought back, God working through men, God could do it, God could abolish the whole world and do everything just by himself, but he loves to work through men when men allow him to work through them by being willing instruments for his activity. And among the greatest willing instruments for divine activity are the people we call doctors of the church. The two great champions of the first and second ecumenical council are commemorated in Our Lady's Month on the second and its octave the ninth. Athanasius and Gregory Nazianzen. Now, this, this is a fact that I don't think anybody in this room will ever forget now. <clears throat> Who else is in the month of May among the doctors of the church? St. Robert Bellarmine, we already referred to that fact. He has, he's on the same day as Our Lady of Fatima the 13th. And the one English doctor of the church, St. Pete. St. Pete, on the 27th. And how I would love it someday to read his book, Someday I will assign in one of our courses to study the history written by St. Pete, the ecclesiastical, one of the most inspiring books ever penned by anybody. So someday we will study it together. Well then, having nine feasts connected with the Holy Family, oh, we have two, two, we have two feasts connected with the uh, apostles. One is two apostles on the same day, the 11th, Saints Philip and James. And then one of the two feasts of St. John the Evangelist, St. John before the Latin Gate, that's the feast of his martyrdom. They said they tried to boil him in boiling oil before the Latin Gate. And as the martyrology put it, almost humorously, he came from it healthier than he went in. <laughs> so it did him some good. And then he lived many years, and he wrote both his gospel and his apocalypse after that fact. So you could say correctly and truly that every one of the twelve apostles was a martyr. But then you have to make one exception, the exception that proves the rule, that one of the twelve apostles, namely St. John, did not die in his martyrdom, survived his martyrdom, then died in peace. But he went through the horrors, the sufferings, the pains of martyrdom, almost more than if he had died instantly. I think if you threw me into a big, very big pan of boiling oil, uh, it, it's horrible to think about it, but in one second and all consciousness is gone. But to be still conscious there, 
You can imagine what pains he felt and what horror. But then he came out of it just healthier than ever. So that's 2 and 7, 9 and 4, 13. So we don't need too many to go to finish our quota. However, there are so many very beautiful feasts. Today is the feast of St. Eric. Now make sure you all congratulate Eric. Is he still here? <laughs> this is his feast day today, the 18th of May, St. Eric. And it's also the fee in the month of May, we have St. Monica on the 4th, who is the patroness of our Tuesday uh, class. St. Pius V is in May, one day after St. Monica. May 5th. What a great saint. If you want to start getting interested in the story of the church, you begin by saints like St. Saint Pius V. Between his time, he died in 1572, and the time of St. Pius X, there is only one blessed among the popes. Now that's a little bit sad. Why is it? The first 32 popes were all martyrs, and I think the first 54 popes were all canonized. Now, if the popes had been living up to their assignment of holiness a little better, I think the world would be in a much better condition. But we have three popes in the last 500 years who have Two of them canonized, one blessed. Who are the canonized popes? Pius V and Pius X. Or maybe if we ever get Pius XV, he will get canonized. And who is the blessed? Blessed Innocent XI. The pope under whom the great victory of Vienna was won in 1683. Under the King John Sobieski and Prince Eugene of Savoy. So, St. Bernardino of Siena is on the 20th, St. Augustine of Canterbury is on the 28th. Well, we have more than each our quota, so I will just let you go at that. Now, for our song today, let me see, did they get me? I asked this, I think if they haven't come, we just have to do the uh, Benny. I asked the brothers to get me the... Uh, Veni Sancte Spiritus, et emitte celitus lucis tue radium. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts uh, and emit and send forth in a heavenly manner the ray of thy light. Veni Pater Pauperum, come, Father of the poor. Veni Dator Munerum, come, giver of gifts. Veni Lumen Corium, come, light of hearts. What beautiful phrases. Every one of them could be the subject of meditation. You can almost... I could imagine St. Francis of Assisi going to ecstasy at every one of these words. It would take him two hours to wake him up. <laughs> Consolator optime, most wonderful consoler, dulcis hospes anime, sweet guest of the soul, dulce refrigerium, in labore requies, rest in labor, in, in estu temperies, coolness when it is hot, in to solatium, when there is sorrow, solace, consolation. O lux beatissima, O most blessed light, replicordis intima, fill the most intimate, the most interior parts of the heart, tuorum fidelium of thy faithful ones. Sine tuo numine, without thy divine help, nihil est in homine, there is nothing in man, nihil est in noxium, there is nothing that is harmless. Lava quod est solidum, wash what is dirty. Riga quod est aridum, irrigate water what is arid. Sana quod est saucium, heal what is wounded. Flecte quod est rigidum, bend what is rigid, our will, our stubborn will that won't cooperate. Fove quod est frigidum, warm what is cold. Rege quod est divium. Rege, rule, guide, like a shepherd would the sheep after they have left the path. Div devious means having gone away, wandered away from the true path. Datuis fidelibus, give to thy faithful ones, in te confident confidentibus, confiding in thee, sacrum septenarium, the sevenfold gift, the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. Da virtutis meritum, give the merit of virtue. Da salutis exitum, give the outcome of salvation. That means a successful life. When the life ends in salvation, that's what you call a successful life. 
how foolish the world is when they call a man is a great success <laughs> and he ends up in hell for all eternity. What kind of success is that? Da perenne gaudium, give everlasting joy. Hallelujah. Joy, that seems to be the word for our Sunday today, joy. So will you please lead us?